coming up, I try to get to grips with the trick stick. I play some games. Jeff does something cool with the next. And I end with a typing. Let's get on then. The humble joystick. Plug it into an interface, select the right option on the game, and away you go. Over time, several companies tried to improve this simple design, and came up with a variety of strange designs and ideas. One such design was the Cheetah Rat, the first infrared joystick. It worked, sort of. Another interesting one was the Trick Stick from East London Robotics. Initially announced in Home Computing Weekly in September 1983, it was described as a multifunction sensor-driven joystick that could emulate a Kempston in one mode, but also provide proportional control in another. Designed by brothers Mark and Roger Bellacott, it used phototransistors to detect proximity, movement and pressure on the buttons, and so provide better control for games written to use it. Taking a sideways step here for a moment, there was a third brother called Clive, who was a doctor, and he used the same technology and was about to launch a new add-on to view heart rates called the Ticker Tracer. This device would use the same sensors, but have an infrared connection to the spectrum to display various graphs. This device never made it to market, but it does sound very similar to the heart rate monitor from Magenta Electronics that I reviewed in episode 90. Anyway, back to the trick stick. For a rather surprising price of £28, you got this interesting looking rod that was connected to an equally interesting interface. It came with an example tape and manual, which I don't have, so I downloaded both from the internet. First, the joystick element. It's quite light, and the buttons don't really push in. There's a rotary control on one side, and this is used to adjust the sensitivity of the proportional control. I'd never tested this or plugged it into the spectrum until now, and so carefully I connected it up and powered it on. So far, so good. I wrote a small program that looked at port 31, port used for the Kempston joystick, and this failed to show anything at all. I then loaded the test program supplied with it, and that didn't work either, and this was worrying. I swapped the jumpers to set the stick to speed control mode and tried again, but still nothing. I tried it on a different spectrum, with different games, with the jumpers set to both Kempston and speed controlled, and yet again nothing worked. It appears that this is a dead joystick, it has ceased to be. And now that leaves me with a bit of a gap in this episode. Ah, this'll do. Let's try something else then. The Spectrum lacked a joystick interface when first released, mainly to keep the cost down, and also because Sir Clive thought the machine would be suited to education and small businesses. Companies and individuals soon began to produce a variety of different interfaces, with a range of different specifications, and software houses often had to make a choice of which one to support. They had the cursor interfaces that emulated the cursor keys, they had the AGF version, the Protec version, and of course the Kempston version. With so many standards, some companies opted to support them all, or provide different means to replicate key presses. AGF were one of these companies, and produced some standout interfaces because of their design. Their joystick interface too, for example, did away with the plastic case of normal interfaces and gave us a view of the circuit board and chips. And this one, the AGF programmable interface. It used a series of wires that you connected to a rail to set the key to emulate for the directions and fire. It looked strangely futuristic and different from any other interface on the market. AGF also produced the protocol range of interfaces. Protocol 1 was a normal looking interface that supported ProTech and cursor formats. The Protocol 2 was a simple Kempston compatible interface. The Protocol 3 and 4, however, were a different thing altogether. The Protocol 3 had pins and custom cards which were used to set up different key options. And then came the ultimate interface, the Protocol 4. This huge add-on, costing £29.95, included a switch to enable Kempston compatibility and a series of small cards and pins to do the rest of the work. So how did this work then? 
Let's take a look and find out. The interface is large, as you can see. On the right hand side is a standard 9 pin D socket. At the rear is a pass through port, although you have to be careful in which order to plug things in. And on the top it had a reset button and a two position switch. A recess on the top has a matrix of keys printed on it and there are slots and guides for the cards. The switch on top when in the down position sets it to Kempston compatibility and when in the up position it sets it to use the cards. The cards are oblong pieces of plastic with a series of holes in them. The cards slot into the top of the interface and hinge down. Three of the cards come preset to different joystick standards, those being AGF, the ZX Interface 2 Player 1 and the ZX Interface 2 Player 2. To play a game that uses these formats, you set the interface to card mode and insert the card, clip it down and you're ready to go. Now, to set up a new control card to simulate a key press, for example Q, A, O, P and space, you start off with an empty card. You look up the key needed, in our example Q for up. On the grid you will see it in row 10 and column 0. On the back of the card you will see arrows that represent directions and a series of numbers from 0 to 15. So to set the Q to represent up, you put two pegs onto the card on the row for up, one in 0 and one in 10. Does that all make sense? Well, let's do it again for a real game, Attic Attack. This uses Q, W, E, R and T, which is a bit odd. So the Q represents left, and on the matrix we can see that Q needs pegs at 10 and 0 on the left section of the card. W is right, so pegs need to be in 10 and 1. E is down, so pegs need to be at 10 and 2. And R is up, meaning pegs at 10 and 3. T is fire, so finally we put pegs in 10 and 4. Phew! You can order extra pegs and cards if needed. You can also order extra cardboard reminder cards that tell you where the pegs should be for each game, in case you can't be bothered to look it up. Have you got all that? Well it did take me quite a while to figure it all out. Once all that's done though, you put the card back in the interface, hinge it down and clip it in place. With the switch in the down position, it's now time to load a game. It seems that this interface has had some use in its time, and you need to put a little pressure on the pegs to get some of them to trigger a response. So we'll just put that down to old age, and be grateful that it works at all. The unit works with my Div MMC, but it has to be put in between the spectrum and the interface. A quick change of pegs for a different key layout, and things work well. Giving the player a choice of most, if not all, potential options for controlling games, this is a great device, if a little large. I'm not sure I would have gone for this, it's too big for a start and most games post-1983 supported the Kempston standard anyway, or at least gave you decent keys to use or the option to redefine them. An interesting piece of kit though, and one that at least worked. The 80s, an era of invention, and a little bit of craziness too. Laser tag was popular. You strapped a red light to your chest, turned on your infrared plastic gun, and ran around trying to shoot each other. Warehouses were converted into futuristic arenas, and everyone had a good time, unless of course you fell over and broke an arm or leg. Laser tag arenas and events are still with us today, but let's get on to the game that was spawned by the original. This is Laser Tag, released in 1988 by Go. Once past the nice dynamic loading screen, which is very nice, so let's just watch this for a while.
and we get onto the game itself. What we have then is a fairly simple run and gun game, set in an arena. You have to work your way through the ranks, starting as a neophyte. There are different types of game, and you play these in a set order. First one will be shootout, and here you run around and shoot anything that moves. You can pick up power-ups, if you can spot them on the monochrome background. The game scrolls vertically, and the sprites are smooth and well-defined. For a game that claims to be 128k, the sound is very poor. Just a few zaps when you fire, and the odd sound when something happens on screen. If you get shot, the screen flashes red, but there's no sound to indicate what has happened. Your lives do decrease though, as shown in a small circle at the top left of the screen. When you shoot someone else, they stick their hands in the air and float off the side of the screen. Rather odd. If you get past this stage, the next one is Target. Now these stages are not described very well, even on the large instruction sheet that comes with the game, but this level apparently tests your accuracy. Here you move up the screen continuously without any control other than left, right and fire, and you have to take out as many targets, without missing, to get a good score. The scores and ranks are displayed at the end. And then you move on to the next rank of Beamer, and it all starts again, but with a little bit more difficulty thrown in. You can get stuck on the scenery sometimes, because it's often difficult to see what's an obstacle and what's just patterned flooring. Some elements of the scenery can be shot too, and these can double or quadruple your laser fire, sending out shots in various directions. Later levels include floating things that you can shoot randomly, and collections for health and timers, at least that's what the graphics look like. I found that unless I went to the very top of the map, the level never ended, and that's not mentioned in the instructions either. Overall, I'm not really sure it relives the laser tag experience. It seems like a run and gun game with the laser tag name added. It's very much like Alien Syndrome, or even Commando. For 1988 though, it should have been much better. Tapper was released into the arcades by Bally Midway in 1983, and sees you controlling a barman trying to serve customers. You move between four bars, pulling pints, and slinging them towards the waiting customers. Later levels sees empty glasses being thrown back for you to collect, and a variety of different bars and customers to serve. The original machines were meant to be placed in bars, so when the machines moved to the arcades, the Budweiser theme was removed and replaced by root beer. A jolly, frantic arcade game with nice tunes and good animation then. But what about the Spectrum version? US Gold released Tapper in 1985, with the cover having Sega plastered all over it. The game does its best to recreate the arcade look, and even with a limited palette it looks okay. The sprites are smaller and less defined, and the beer, oh sorry, soda glasses, are much smaller than the arcade machine. Beeper tune soon gets irritating, but there is a 1 to 8 AY fix for the game if you look hard enough. The gameplay remains the same though with your bartender rushing about trying to serve customers. Later, glasses do come back at him as well, and with tips for extra points, if you can get them before allowing any glasses to fall on the floor. There is a minigame thrown in, and I hate it. You see a line of tins. A bandit shakes them up, apart from one, and then you have to guess which one it is. If you pick the wrong one, it explodes in your face.
Then it's back to the action in a different bar. You lose a life by either allowing an empty glass to hit the floor, by throwing a full glass where there's no customers, or by letting a customer get to the end of the bar without serving them. You can wrap around the screen vertically, which can come in handy, especially at busier times. It retains the frantic gameplay of the original, and overall, if you enjoyed the arcade version, then this would suit you fine. There have been a lot of new titles recently, so let's take a look at a few. This is Angels, from Zosha Entertainment, released in late December 2021. The game has a really good intro to lead you into the story. And before long, we're in the thick of the action. There are two characters, and they are women from another planet, sent to Earth to fight crime as punishment. The graphics are fantastic, as you can see, and by now you'll know that this is a beat-em-up. You move left to right, taking on the bad guys and beating them to a pulp. Now I'm not a fan of beat-em-ups in general, but I have to admire this game for its use of the machine. You can swap characters at any point, for example swapping out the one on low health, or swapping to the one that has a fireball. If you do get far enough, which I couldn't, there's also a vertical shooting section. Overall then, a fantastic game. If you remember far back, Toki was an arcade game that never made it to the spectrum. Screenshots did appear in magazines, but the game was never completed. This then, Toki Mao from Pat Moriarty team, addresses that and gives us a fantastic version. The game is not free, but for less than the price you pay for a coffee, you can grab the tape or disc download. The game has two modes, arcade, which is the classic five-stage arcade version, or the extended mode, which adds five more levels and introduces exploration and use of money. The presentation throughout is superb, and the game looks really nice. Gameplay too is spot on, and the music that plays through the game really matches the action. The graphics are smooth and the sound effects work really well, and this is a great game, and one you should think about if you're looking for something new. episodes ago, I looked at using the capabilities of the Next to enhance Spectrum games, namely adding backgrounds and borders using Layer 2 and Sprites. That got me thinking, what else could you do with the capabilities of the Next to enhance Spectrum games? Way back in episode 70, Paul had created a mock-up of Jetpack using Defender Sounds. He had asked me if I thought there was a quick way to do that, maybe something to listen in the background for key presses and then play Defender Sound samples when a key was pressed. After thinking about it for a little while, I thought, no, I don't think there is. Fast forward to a few months ago, and I'd recently figured out how the Spectrum Next DMA works. 
and I was looking at some example code of using the DMA to play sound samples using the Corvox pause. Figuring out the DMA took me a little while. What the DMA does is it reads from one place and writes to another. Simple as that. Those places can be either memory or ports. In the case of playing sound samples, you read from memory and write to the Corvox pause. And what makes the DMA really good for sound samples is that it can work in burst mode. That means that it will allow the CPU to do whatever it needs to do while the DMA isn't doing anything. Looking at the DMA, there are six registers that you write to to tell it what to do. This table comes from the Spectrum Next wiki and shows those six registers and what they do. In my case, the trick to figuring out the DMA was to realise that when you write to the registers, the way you identify them is with a few bits, normally the highest bit and either two or three start bits. Also, having written a register, if you set certain bits, the DMA is expecting additional information next, port numbers, speed, etc. Once I'd figured out that, I was ready to go. So going back to Paul's request of being able to put sound samples into Jetpack, I thought you could do this with the DMA. Jetpack is perfect for doing this as there exists a really good and very well documented disassembly created by Michael R. Cook. The other thing that makes Jetpack really good is that it's a 16K game, which means you've got a bit of extra memory to play with, somewhere to store the sound samples and somewhere for the DMA code. First thing I did was create some samples that sounded sufficiently like Defender to give the correct effect, having written the code to play them through the Spectrum Next DMA. Next, I got the Jetpack disassembly, looked at it, and as I said, it is really, really well documented. The comments in the disassembly are excellent and showed me exactly where I needed to add the sound samples. There is one small problem with running Jetpack on the Next, and that's to do with the shadow screen paging that was introduced in the 128K Spectrum. Jetpack writes to that port for some reason, so you have to disable it, which is a simple out command. I made sure that was the very, very first thing that happened in the assembly of Jetpack before anything else. I then wrote a bit of code to set up the Next, the Corvox port and the DMA, and called the code to play the samples from Jetpack. I ended up using bank switching on the next to be able to fit all the samples in. And then it was simply time to compile it, run it and see what happened. And this was a result. At this point, I have to give a huge shout out to Michael Cook, who created the disassembly for Jetpack. He really did an excellent job. When I started looking at this, I thought getting the samples into Jetpack was going to be the hardest part. Michael made it the easiest part. Thank you, Michael. Until next time, happy gaming. This is Harry Rattack, released by Jarrell Software in 1983, and here we have a kind of mix between Scramble and Defender. But before the game, how about the loading screen effect? Anyway, onto the game. You pilot a Harrier, taking off from an aircraft carrier and heading towards the enemy island. There's quite a bit of the game where nothing happens as soon as you leave the carrier, but it isn't long before things start to heat up. On the way, you have to avoid flak, fired from land-based tanks and guns, as well as enemy planes that take a shot at you. You have missiles and bombs to use, but you need to keep some bombs back to get more points when you get to the island.
but the screen scrolls in character squares and all movement within the game is the same. Sound consists of a few thuds as the flak is fired and a loud explosion when you get hit. You only get one life too, so if you get hit, it's the end of the game. Control is easy enough if you like using the cursor keys. The enemy planes move up and down as you get closer to them, and not always to line up with you, so you have to be careful and have quick reflexes. You can take a few hits from the flak on easy mode before you explode. On harder levels though, it has to be avoided. You can fly at different speeds, although the inlay does say you need to move fast to avoid running out of fuel. If you do manage to get to the island, you can bomb the buildings for points before landing back on the carrier. Now when I got this game back in 1983, I couldn't play it, and nothing seems to have changed as you can see. I do remember there being hidden or invisible flak too, possibly in the clouds, which is either very sneaky or a bug. An early game then, that many people like. Good for a 1983 16K title, and one to have a go on if you enjoyed it first time round. This is Alpha Chase, written by Patrick Vesey, and published in Popular Computing Weekly July 1983. This full page listing had decent print quality, so there were only a few of my own typos that stopped it working. The idea is to move around the screen, collecting letters in the correct alphabetical order. The letters and asterisks, which are deadly, are placed at random each game, and your arrow constantly moves. Sliding with the wall or the asterisks will lose you a life. Collecting the wrong letter will also lose you a life. The game starts slow but increases in speed after each completed screen and can become quite challenging. It's a simple little game and this is probably the first time it's been seen in over 30 years. It will be available to download from my website soon.